<laughs> oh, there you the go. The caller just thought a lot of people were using um, Zoom backgrounds. That was interesting to see. Oh, yeah. Yeah, mine doesn't work so next well. Thing I want to do. I want to get a cool uh, face like they did on Saturday Night Live. Anybody see that? Oh, yeah, the filters. <laughs> and you have your eyes going around. I have to do that. It'd be so funny. I'd love to do Mark. that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to arrange that, Mike. I need to show of hands to start. How many people are getting at-home food deliveries? Show of hands. We're no? cooking. I got one. Okay, well, so once in a while. I mean, like from a Whole Foods or a Baldor's or... Yeah. Yep. Okay. They I, won't do it. They but won't I'm do going it around to the us. Store too, but if I, I got do. one and then I haven't been able to like the oh, Amazon Whole Foods, I haven't been able to get uh, a time because it's always... There There aren't any times to, that are available. Jen, you might, you might want to try in the mid-afternoon. We found... The local shop, right? Oh, uh, mid afternoon, like three o'clock, four o'clock, even. And yeah, one of the shop rights in the uh, next next door town shut uh, is not is closed now because they couldn't get workers there. Huh. Oh, that was last week. So it is. Um, <laughs> it's a battle. All right, I will. Jen, I will it's, kind of like, it's, it's kind of like concert. You know, being in line to get concert yes. tickets. I kind of pile all the stuff I want in my whole food order into my basket, yes. and I check it couple minutes but I think I've done about 10 orders from them and actually the last one was uh, Sunday I, I caught them at 8 had a delivery by 10 of everything including toilet paper so, wow nice. we can't get yeah. um, I keep right. on Amazon you know, I did it. not think that this was going to be the kind of logistics we'd be talking about today <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not, so it's not. Is, we're just starting it we're going to get started well, in a minute logistics is taken well, on yeah, we are going to get started in a minute and we can we can share uh, i will tell you i've been uh, informing <laughs> fucking people about all the innovative techniques they've gotten uh they've set up to get their food supplies at various items it's, it's been very interesting it's also interesting to see how how companies and organizations are pivoting to uh to address the new need as well as the loss of customers in their traditional channel so with that jam why don't you just go yes. through 30, 30 seconds of uh administration stuff sure. and then i'll introduce him yeah. um welcome everyone to today's screenside chat um we're talking about covid19 and the supply chain uh, mike is joined today by ann strauss weeder our resident logistics expert from the north jersey transportation planning authority um welcome to everyone, um, Mike and Ann are going to be talking about different um, logistics related topics. And then afterwards, we'll have time for plenty of time for some question and answers. So if everyone can mute yourselves until Ann and Mike, you know, until it's question time. Um, and then um, there's not so many people. So we'll, we will, you can either um, type out some questions or unmute yourself and ask the question but we'll figure it out so welcome and thanks, so Jen. Mike. thank you so once again ann is uh, director of freight planning for north jersey transportation planning authority and she is the go-to person uh for naop at least as it relates to um uh, industrial and supply chain issues so we i've got five questions ann i'm going to just toss them out to you and then you you uh, respond as you see fit and if people have questions as we go along, comments, just you can send a note to Jen or just speak up if Jen permits that. <laughs> okay, and so give us a brief update on the state of the supply chain as it impacts the New Jersey region. And how, do, how are we comparing to the rest of the country? Well, let's start with uh, the situation that we're in right now. It is unprecedented. Uh, I've been through, I would say this is my fourth major resiliency event, disruptive event. Uh, the one thing that does keep supply chain professionals and resiliency professionals up at night is trying to think through what didn't I think about or what, what have I not thought about. And of course, what usually hits you is the one thing you didn't think about. And I don't think any of us here could have expected a pandemic that affects the world all the way down to local communities. So we are in 
a very uncharted situation. So first of all, from that perspective, when we talk about a, a supply chain resiliency situation, we look at it in a couple of ways. One is um, how much time there was to prepare. And we did have some time to prepare, it was, but it was more uh, that we didn't have a lot. We didn't realize, I think, the severity of it hitting us the way it did. Uh, we talk about the kind of freight facilities and regions affected. This is interesting. It is not an infrastructure event. So all of our infrastructure is intact. So we have our ports, we have our airports, we have our roadways, we have our railroads. However, that's where things start changing, because then we start talking about the commodities and the industries affected. And I don't think there's anyone on the call here who has not been affected or is feeling this. This is probably an event that will um, affect or be the, the, um, the item that is known by this generation. So how is it affecting us? Well, let's talk immediate, immediate situation. Uh, being asked to shelter in place. Uh, the change in consumer demand. Um, we will not speak of the hoarding of toilet paper or, or some, of the, uh, some of the rushes to get things, but it was a change in, in consumer demand, a real rush to stock up, to prepare, to shelter in place. At the same time, retail purchases, store shutting down, tourism, uh, recreational, travel, uh, and for that matter, production facilities because uh, production facilities were shutting down because they couldn't get supplies, or if they were addressing retail companies, their clients didn't want the work anymore. Or, and this is a very important thing, really have to ensure the security and the safety of their workforce. So that's a big change. The, the demand for freight services shifted, the supply of freight services uh, shifted. Um, so how are we standing up? First of all, the port is operational. It has not closed the terminal. Uh, all vessels are being handled. There were a number of longshoremen that were um, struck by the, uh, the virus. Uh, they did have two fatalities, unfortunately. Uh, but nearly everyone who uh, was stricken is back at work, social distancing, uh, personal protective equipment, PPE is being used and uh, all the vessels are being worked. There are other ports around the country that have closed terminals because of a lack of vessel calls. Yes, the number of vessel calls um, has declined. The number of what's called blank sailings has increased, uh, where vessels are coming without goods on them or they're skipping shipments or what we've discovered for the Port of New York and New Jersey, okay, they may skip a port in the south and they're bringing all the cargo to here. So we're doing better than a number of other ports. Air cargo. The three largest air cargo operators at, port, at, at Newark Liberty International, UPS, FedEx, and United Airlines. When the number of passenger flights were cut, the uh, amount of belly cargo capacity went down. Air cargo is important in terms of you know, getting critical goods as well as, as we start ramping up again. Uh, but if it is there, it is slightly more expensive. In terms of ocean rates, uh, not very good at the moment. We're talking bulk cargo. Uh, there's a whole number of uh, situations separate from the pandemic involving uh, oil pricing and what that's done both in the U.S. and for bulk movements overseas, as well as several countries that have completely closed uh, their borders to external business uh, for the time being. So there are serious issues in terms of some of the carriers and, and capability there. But right now we are, we are handling the cargo there. Um, we are not handling as much as we used to. In terms of railroading, Everybody, it's completely operational. They did have a number of workers stricken uh, by COVID-19, um, but they're all back at work and they're all healthy and they're handling all the cargo being moved by the freight rail. The area where they have seen a decline in cargo has been in auto transport, not surprising. That's one of the industries that's been affected. 
Now let's turn to trucking. And there it is very much, I'll call it almost a whack-a-mole situation. And we can talk about long distance trucking, trucking between um, facilities and last mile. And I'll start with last mile because I can, I can tell by everyone on the room here, you're probably ordering a lot more online than you ever did before. So the demand for uh, last mile delivery of retail and food products through the ceiling, uh, far more than anticipated, it really strains the system. Uh, in some cases for carriers like UPS, yeah, huge amount more, uh, more shipments. And you think, wow, they're doing really well. Well, yes and no. So they have a lot more shipments to home. That was a UPS truck dropping something at my front door just now. All by a FedEx truck, as a matter of fact. Timing is everything in this. Uh, but UPS is having uh, some financial issues because, yes, that market went up, but their big profit area is business to business, and that's way down. So you know, we are seeing some issues in the integrated carriers. When we talk about the truckload versus less than truckload carriers. Both segments of the industry were having difficulties prior to COVID-19, particularly the less than truckload carriers. Less, tru less than truckload carrier means that their trailer is carrying uh, loads for a variety of companies at the same time. And a lot of them were focused on retail and retail tanked. So yes, uh, there are some still moving. Uh, because of um, social distancing requirements as well as shortages of workers uh, at industrial facilities, it's now taking longer to load and offload a truck. So uh, detention time is increasing. That is causing some concern for drivers. Uh, as well as all the hardships involved in transporting. I will say that they're very much a dedicated group of drivers, and it's very nice to see in the press the recognition that these individuals continue to drive vehicles and deliver products and, and really have taken a passion to it. Uh, in that regard, it's been very important as we've dealt with um, uh, changes in requirements from the federal government, such as suspension of hours of service rules for critical industries at the state level, um, uh, allowing overweight movements of certain critical commodities, such as food, um, local ordinances about pickup and delivery and where trucks can park. All that's important, even in terms of keeping rest areas open. This happened in Pennsylvania first, where one of the immediate things that happened um, with COVID-19 was Pennsylvania turned, had shut all the rest areas, broke them off. So the drivers had no place to stop, no place to get food, no place to securely park their vehicle. That doesn't help when you're trying to move goods, even if you have your hours of service rules um, suspended. Everyone worked really, really hard in Jersey over the matter of 12 hours, made sure that every facility in New Jersey was open, not just the private ones, but all the public ones along the turnpike. And then uh, our organization working with our fellow agencies in Pennsylvania, New York, and Connecticut uh, elevated the, the importance of the issue. New York and Connecticut never uh, shut their rest areas. Uh, Pennsylvania has reopened just about all of them. And New York City has established two temporary facilities to try to help out truckers bringing in critical commodities. Those two temporary facilities are at um, Staten Island at the uh, GCT uh, facility, the marine terminal there, and one near Hunts Point. So the bottom line is the freight system has pivoted and we are getting goods in. Uh, what I also find very, um, we should consider a source of pride for New Jersey, is when we talk about the supply chain, there's been a lot of thoughtful consideration about everyone affected. So if we're talking about food, it's not just food being delivered to your house or delivered to the supermarket. It's, um, it's considering everyone who's in a food program and receives allocations or may have to go in person or can only go at certain times of the month and get certain things. Or a community food bank, that's something that NAOP has been very supportive of. And the community food bank was, was terribly affected. Uh, all those commodities they got as, as uh, Donations they weren't getting. 
United Airlines, Bank of America, lots of companies have, have come forward to help them supply to get the goods out to all the population. The biggest issue affecting supply chains right now, particularly in New Jersey, is workforce. We had shortages before this, and they became uh, considerably greater. Uh, the state of New Jersey set up a COVID-19 uh, jobs portal with tens of thousands of jobs being offered, everything from the folks in the supermarket um, to everyone working in the warehouses. Um, a lot of the companies are offering higher pay, recognizing that there is some concern about personal safety. And there's been a lot of efforts to ensure the safety of people. How do we stack up uh, nationally in that regard? Well, we're in a state that has the second greatest concentration of the virus. So I don't think we're doing poorly, but you are gonna notice some differences. For example, you're probably seeing products by companies you never heard of before in the supermarket because they're trying to source them from different places to keep the supply going. You may see less variability in what's being provided to you because of standardization to try to get more out with facilities that are open. Now, elsewhere in the country, as you've heard, of course, on the radio and uh, news reports, uh, production facilities of meat products have uh, been closing because of concerns about the virus. Similarly, the cost of eggs has gone up for two reasons. One is how eggs are picked uh, and social distancing required. And then I just heard recently that there was a shortage of the cardboard containers to put the eggs in that would go to the supermarket. So these are little hiccups along the way. But if anything, New Jersey was well set with our industrial space as of the first quarter of this year. Uh, about 833 million square feet in the northern and central part of New Jersey. Uh, an astonishing 14.5 million under construction, I think in 38 buildings. Uh, when we go start talking about, uh, as we move out of this pandemic, we can talk about what that means. But I think having an e-commerce fulfillment platform here in New Jersey has helped. So, I think I've talked enough about your first question, Mike. Um, um, have to unmute you, sir. So, I, what, the the uh, this morning um, I I participated in a call with the governor's office as I do three times a week, and um, we were talking about the uh, the governor's um, uh, collaborating with the private sector and other um, folks around the country putting together a couple councils, one to deal with more macro level issues longer term, and one more um, micro issues short term. We are starting to um, see, we will start to see this week, uh, a relaxation on some of these restrictions. Uh, parks and golf outings will reopen in the next couple of days, if um, there's an executive order that is going out today, if it hasn't been out already, which will um, uh, um, spell that out, how that's to be done. More of these will be happening in the weeks to come. Uh, BOMA International, thank you, Pat Hanley, has um, put together some guidelines for building owners on how to reopen their buildings and addressing issues like, um, you name it, HVAC and cleaning and legal issues, insurance, uh, social distancing, et cetera. Um, so, so as we start to dial back the, the amount of restrictions that are in place um, around the country, realizing the choke points that are currently, um, uh, you know, affecting the industrial sector, and, and by that I'm referring to the workforce, those issues, perhaps. And um, given the fact that certain types of retail certainly will be handicapped for a while, I know minimally when everything reopens, capacity limits will be uh, the big deal. So whereas a store might have accommodated, you know, a thousand shoppers at a time, now it's 500. 
um, little stores, same thing. How is the, how do you see our ability in New Jersey, the, the um, supply chain, the way we're set up, every issue you've just talked about, do you, do you see us being um, able to resume some operation, some level of normal operations, or are some of the changes that we've already started to see, are these more permanent? Meaning a, a lot fewer choices, um, you know, where, where products are being sourced, um, as it relates to, <laughs> um, I mean, we, we should probably all give thought to becoming vegetarians, by the way. But um, just, just to comment on those, those more broader, those, those, um, those immediate disruptions that we've had, we have resulted in uh, changes that are available to consumers, uh, or, or choices, I should say. Do you see them being long-term? Or is this going to be resuming back to some pre-COVID-19, um, you know, situation? Any thoughts? So first of all, it's a trend breaker situation. So we saw that in 2008 with the Great Recession and how it reset uh, customer preferences and purchasing patterns for the time being. I think it is clear to everyone that the rest of 2020 is probably going to be a recessionary time period. So in terms of consumer spending, we're probably looking at a, a uh, less robust period than people may have thought coming into 2020. So that, that is an assumption we can probably consider valid for planning purposes. That being said, there is an acceleration of certain trends uh, that I think the whole group on the phone, and I'm I should on Zoom um, can uh, can consider and really would like to hear what you think as well. First of all, an acceleration of e-commerce and retail trends. Uh, if re if e-commerce was 14 to 15 percent of retail purchases in the past, we're probably going to see an increase in the percent of goods being purchased via e-commerce and delivered rather than people going to stores where possible. So clearly that's going to have implications for brick and mortar stores, for um, operators of retail facilities. And I think it, it, I'm really going to turn to the people who really understand retail more than me, uh, what that's going to mean in terms of malls, of freestanding stores, and what they're going to be. And we're already seeing some retail chains that were in financial distress prior to COVID-19 um, already filing for bankruptcy, uh, whether it's Neiman Marcus, JCPenney, Gap started not paying for their retail space, a few others. So there, there are going to be issues. Uh, I think there needs to be particular attention to uh, local businesses. In a typical disruptive situation where an area has had a major disaster, usually within four years, you lose 40, 60% uh, of your local businesses. That's nothing that we can tolerate here. We really have to see what we can do for that business continuity, for that community con uh, continuity. They're not only the economic base of our communities, but they're also sometimes what shapes our downtowns. So uh, you know, we are gonna see an acceleration of that e-commerce trend. So in that regard, we are very well positioned with the industrial property in our area and the, the reach of our industrial facilities uh, to tackle that, that emerging or an accelerating trend. The second trend that was beginning to occur prior to COVID-19 for several years was a diversification of production plant facilities. That largely happened because of the terrible disaster in Fukushima, uh, which shut down supply chains across the world because that was the location of, of uh, several single plants for certain companies. So they started looking at, okay, I'm going to have a production facility in Asia, one in the Americas, one in Europe. We're going to see that here where uh, people could not get a hold of their suppliers or um, because of changes in international rules, they just, the stuff just wasn't coming. So I, I do think we're going to see uh, more uh, nearshoring and reshoring of production facilities. Uh, combined with maybe a reduction, at least in the short term, of the types of things being produced. And there could be some opportunities because of the density of the, of the consumer population in our area. 
Um, I know we have a couple of, of industrial uh, organizations on this call, so they, they may be able to tell us more about who's, who's making inquiries. But we have seen production facilities come to our area, whether we're talking about the paper box company in Middlesex County, I think that's Cascades, um, the uh, Fatale Beretta, you know, the Italian uh, meat packaging plant in Morris County. Uh, there are a number of production facilities, uh, Winter Bakery uh, in New Brunswick, uh, that have come here, and plastics and others. So we, we, we may be positioned to capture some of that business. The third trend, uh, and one less likely for our area, is some emerging technologies uh, that can also deal with social um, uh, self-isolation. Uh, CVS and IBM have been testing, uh, CVS and UPS have been testing drone deliveries of prescriptions and got permission to start next week in Florida to deliver prescriptions to customers in the villages in Florida. So that aids in, in delivering products to um, a vulnerable community. So we may see some acceleration of technologies that help us meet uh, new goals in terms of, of social distancing and, and getting goods there and the shortages. Uh, and, and finally, uh, we're probably going to be seeing some changes in who is moving the freight uh, because of the precarious financial situation of some of the organizations. So, you know, it's just going to be something to watch and see how that works through. Fascinating. Um, and one more question, if I may, then we'll, we'll open it up to the floor. Um, is there any, does anything come readily to mind on how governments at the local, state, I mean, particularly the state level, what they can be doing now or what they should be thinking about to uh, address some of these, these, or take advantage of the opportunities presented by some of these trends or to um, maybe remove some of the obstacles to some of these choke points or these these areas that we have problems with, whether they be workforce, uh, uh, you know, the technology, um, local restrictions, any thoughts on what governments can do to uh, ameliorate the, um, the problems over the months to come? Well, Mike, like you, um, I also serve on, on, on one of the, the governor's working groups focused on, on food supply chain. And I have to give credit where credit is due because one of the most effective practices in dealing with a, a disruptive event is having close collaborations, knowing who to call, getting people together, talking it through, working the problem, coming up with real-time solutions. And I've been really impressed by um, by the people that, that have been brought together, um, how quickly uh, there's been response from Trenton, um, how there have been uh, a, attempts to order precise um, executive orders um, to, to assist in getting things through. Uh, for example, bringing in health and human services on the food supply chain so that all those uh, issues could be considered. Creating a um, employment portal really uh, targeting uh, furloughed workers. So really thinking it through. And now as we're beginning to come out of it, I agree with you there can be focus in a couple of areas. One is certainly the economic development opportunities. Second, really looking at the lessons learned and what we need to do to pivot uh, to help industries. Um, if a retail chain is pivoting into e-commerce and needs more use of their warehouse, we, you know, we have to recognize that. So this is where, you know, moving into the future now, when we're not entirely sure of what, what's going to be the outcome, uh, we have to see what we can do, A, to support the local businesses that are here, keep them operational, get people back to work, and at the same time say, okay, there are going to be some opportunities. How can we help them along? And then, again, there may be some emerging technologies. We've been looking at them. Uh, Let's see where we can help uh, help move them forward. Sounds like a plan. Okay, Jen, do we have questions or anybody just raise your hand and... Yeah, or you can unmute that. yourself if you have questions and... Or I have a I couple of questions. 
Yes, Diana. Go ahead. Hi, Hi and, and thank you, Anne, for all your information. It's, uh, it's really interesting how you're able to get down into all these specifics of you know, what we see from our consumer standpoint about how everything moves. Um, a couple of questions from the, the land use side. Do you see, given the, the growth in, in e-commerce, that there will be a demand for more um, sort of more urban, smaller scale fulfillment centers or return centers that would have to be um, contemplated or, or permitted in more densely populated areas and rather than just to, in the periphery? Good question. Now that's a really interesting conversation that's taking place right now about what COVID-19 means to land use patterns and where people are going to want to live and where businesses are going to locate. And I was just on a call on that uh, just before this call, because people were beginning to think through what this all means. Um, but I, I think we are going to see more demand for e-commerce services, uh, people like it. Um, as we all go back to work and are no longer doing work from home, and by the way, that's another big area. You know, there, there's been, uh, it's been noted of a social divide among those who can work from home and those that have to go into work. And that's something we are going to have to consider. But as, as we all go back to work, we are probably going to have to look at um, more uh, alternative places for deliveries and how to accommodate this. Um, there are some things we're going to want to go back and do. It's nice to go to the supermarket, but we've seen the conveniences. Um, so I, I do think that you are going to see those kind of facilities. The fact that we have 14 plus million square feet being put in 38 buildings tells me you're looking at more local delivery situations than before. So I think there, that, that the trend is accelerating towards having that e-commerce component. And I bet on the retail stores, it's going to be more, um, you know, I'll bring it to your car or it's ready for pickup, something like that. But there's still a social aspect there. Mm -hmm. Also, do you see, given the, the driver shortages, worker shortages, do you see that giving a push to autonomous trucking? There's a lot that has to happen for autonomous trucking, and we're a very densely developed area, so we're probably going to be the last to see it. Um, where there has been some autonomous use, it's been in largely more rural settings or even non-populated areas, like in Australia. So maybe not, but where there can be some additional automation, you are going to see it where there are workforce shortages. And we are already seeing that in industrial properties in terms of, of what can be done uh, through an automated means rather than through workers if you can't get the workers or if it's really not safe for them to be so close together as they were in the past. And finally, not to take up too more, too much time, but there's been a lot of attention in the, the crisis to uh, pharmaceuticals being produced in other countries. I don't know how much you get into pharmaceuticals, but do you see that there is going to be a movement to reshore some of that manufacturing because of what we've uh, been going through here? Um, I, I would say yes. I mean, as a, again, it's what supply chain professionals stay up all night and think about. Uh, the fact that they could not get supplies, that we were too reliant on a country or a region or a production facility, it says, I can't do that anymore. So I do think you're going to see uh, some move with or without um, public sector participation to move some of that, uh, those operations back to the states or to places we can get at it much more easily or and not be reliant on one trade lane or one country. Okay. Thanks very much. Someone else, um, Mark or Clark, you folks that dabble in the industrial, do you have anything for Ram while you got her? Oh, you doubt you do more than dabble. So you're probably seeing this more than I am. Well, it's like I an inquiry that we speak. No, the, the, the trends are clearly bigger, not smaller. Uh, the infill is going to be tricky uh, just because the, the layout of most of the building stock that's out there doesn't really work. I mean, I think Amazon's doing 22 deals right now in New Jersey. 
uh, and a big chunk of that space is for parking inside. So that, you know, the way that we've used land isn't consistent with kind of historical norms as far as these buildings go. The, the, the very last mile stuff requires a lot of vans and, you know, and that stuff needs to be in close. So, um, you know, I think you're going to see a lot of, of those trends and a lot of the requirements we've seen have gotten bigger. Um, you know, one deal we worked on went from 800,000 feet to a little over a million. Uh, during the during this because it was stuff coming from China and they want to have more you know more inventory in the United States mm. thanks mark that's that's um, that's that's good Clark anything from you anyone Clark is muted. yeah Clark is muted well well, I, I do think that Mark has hit on one other He's point, unmuted. and that's going to be ah, Clark is no longer Sorry. muted. I've had about six questions, but now I forgot what they all were. <laughs> oh, come uh, on. No, it, come on. It, <laughs> no, it's you know the world we're in. It's we're all we're all trying to figure it out, you know, and um, it's obviously a good thing I think for New Jersey. Um, you know, my my concern is just generally in with the state, you know, is the state going to move fast enough for us? You know, there's a window of opportunity for New Jersey to, you know, further cement its lead on with the world of logistics. And is the, is the state going to be moving with us? Um, you know, and not, you know, not, not that the green world isn't important, but I think it, you know, you got to balance the two. And, um, it's, it's always been the case in New Jersey. Um, and I think locally at local municipalities, they're gonna be seeking, you know, rateables to make up for the loss of retail and, and other real estate, you know, any other real estate within their community. And they gotta be aware that industrial is a way for them to grow the rateable base. And they can't be afraid of industrial because it's, it's not the big bad development that they think they are. So it's, it's, it's going to be educating those local municipalities on the benefits of industrial and logistics. And that's how we get people back to work and how we start to fill the township's coffers. And I think they have some unique position to, to do that. Good point, Clark. Agree with you there. I'll go back to you. Yeah, I, I had a question. Um, I guess over the course of the shutdown, have we seen more businesses change from being classified as uh, non-essential to essential based on some of the obs observations of choke points we had in the supply chain? And how do we learn from that for the next time we have like a pandemic? I, well, I, I did see that happen. Um, yes, absolutely. I think from the day these executive orders get issued, um, it, it, very quickly, there were clarifications um, to expand the numbers of businesses considered essential. So if we've learned anything, I think from this disruption, um, it's, it's just that, that there are many more types of, in this new world, um, essential businesses that need to continue to accommodate all the various uh, um, demographics out there. So yeah, I mean, Sean, do you have anything in particular? Well, you'd like just, it's a large web and like in particular, uh, for instance, say like if there's a, um, a small business needing a storage facility, uh, is that considered essential? But you know, we have warehouses, that, I'm just talking about construction projects now. So we have warehouse projects that are going on because they are essential to the supply chain. But with small businesses, what if they store dry goods in local storage containers, self-storage? And is that really considered an essential construction project? Sean, you've hit on something you we're really going to have to look at as we, as we get through this. Yep. Uh, because we, as, mm -hmm. as Mike said, we are determining real quickly what is critical. Uh, and, and there's had to be some redefining of what critical is. Uh, we talked about trucking. We knew trucking was critical, but then we're, yes, restaurants are critical. 
Repair places are critical. Higher supply places are critical. So I think that's going to be one of the things we have to learn out of here. And as you said, uh, you know, if, if we're seeing small businesses or retailers trying to pivot or needing to store goods, it, it's really understanding that because while we can all hope we're never in this situation again, we have to learn what we can from this situation better prepare for next time. So we, we can't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, Go yeah ahead, no, I'm sorry. I, I would also say that um, I'm not so sure that the next time we <laughs> issue we get to this this stage of a crisis, um, if they'll continue to use the same definitions. I mean, there's going to be different lenses um, applied to operating. So I guess we're still learning, but I would have to believe that many businesses that under this crisis were not never never got to be essential in the next crisis might be able to squeeze by as essential if they operate within certain restrictions so who knows i i i think there's going to be a way of doing things um in in the future that even what was considered non-essential in this shutdown may be allowed to continue, but under strict, um, using adherence to strict guidelines. That, that's what I would expect. Yeah. Any, hey. anyone? Else? So, Anne, I've got a question. Um, simply due to the way that COVID behaves, um, let's say we are all out and about, um, due to the fact that COVID's rising in surrounding states, and um, there's nothing saying that we can't have a second round of COVID, what does that mean for logistics and development um, in terms of freezer space, as well as is there a possibility that we could have too much industrial if we have a recession, as well as which would result in a pullback and less spending? Well, we're already we're already seeing uh, cutbacks in orders. Um, there was some concern at the beginning of um, COVID-19 that the ports would have to deal with containers coming in and retailers not accepting them. But instead, what happened is retailers just canceled their orders overseas. So a lot of that um, restructuring to deal with the current economic conditions has already taken place. So I would venture to say at this point, companies are beginning to go beyond what's currently happening to uh, repositioning themselves for the future. So um, I can't look into the crystal ball and eat too much brown glass in terms of where retail is going to wind up, because I think uh, folks in that particular sector are trying to think through uh, what people are going to be looking for going into the fall versus now. Um, interestingly, uh, there was a, a chart published of uh, what people are buying and what they're not buying, at least in March. Um, the, number one, the number two thing being purchased online were bread machines. Uh, big increase in purchase of bread machines. I can't say that's going to happen into the fall, but people are breaking bread and it's hard to find yeast. The number one thing that went down by 77% was luggage. That, that, that's that's hold of things, followed by some other items. So you, we are already seeing some of the retail trends, but a lot's going to depend on, um, you know, our workers employed. Do they have the money? Um, what are they buying? What do they need? What do they see? We do not know what the fall looks like for, for COVID-19. A lot of very smart people are trying to figure that out, and a lot of people are very nervous about it. So I, I think everyone is going to be moving ahead with caution and, 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 and again, taking the longer view that we will come out of this and how can they best position themselves. So Mark's already noted uh, some changes in industrial um, requirements, you know, more supply on hand so they don't get stuck uh, with, with no supplies. Um, people are going to start looking now, um, especially if it's more of a recession. Maybe they feel they can cut a better deal. and. They're going to start looking at production facilities. Um, 
in terms of wage rate and transportation costs, we were already becoming better positioned to have more things done um, in the U.S. than we were in the past. So I, I, I think you are going to be seeing some of these trends occur, and a lot will uh, be under the consideration of the uh, economic environment. Um, but it's already brought up, are we looking at a U, are we looking at an L? Um, I think everyone is hopeful that 2021 will be a better year than 2020. Yeah. Barb, did you have a bar? Barb? Uh, she was saying a, a prayer there, yes. <laughs> okay, all right. And are we all good? Any any last question? One one more question, We're, and, and then I think we'll uh, call it quits for today, if there is one. Clark, no? Okay. Okay. So I would say we've done a good job of covering uh, a lot, um, a lot of issues here. Um, and Anne, I want to thank you for your time as always. And it's always comforting to know we know who to call and who to speak to for the for the right answers. So thank you. Well, this is what it's what NAOP's all about, and all the really smart people here. I, I suspect this is the beginning of a conversation among a lot of us uh, yes. going into smaller and uh, just thinking through what we've learned along the way and how we can position ourselves. There you go. All right. So keep keep in touch, folks. We'll talk to you soon. Bye. Stay Thanks healthy so much. and safe, everyone. Thanks, Anne. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thanks, Anne. Thanks, everyone.